I was sitting in a police interrogation room in one of the Midwestern cities where I had spent my entire life. My friend and lawyer Ralph Boston was sitting next to me, and for the second time in the last five minutes, he whispered to me to remain silent and exercise my right to an attorney. My name is Lucas Worthington, and this name exuded privilege and wealth, especially when combined with my rarely used pseudonym Rockefeller as a sign of respect for my wealthy parents. I may be rich, but it's not because I inherited money. I made my fortune as a dot-com specialist, and by the age of 29 I had accumulated more than $50,000. Despite my wealth, I don't consider myself part of the upper class. I'm just an ordinary guy who happens to have money. I like to drink beer, play basketball, attend baseball games, and sometimes get into fights. In addition to my leisure time, I devote at least 40 hours a week to volunteer work, mainly at a charity organization that I founded to help children in need in the poorest areas of my city. I'm preparing to interrogate two detectives about the sudden deaths of my wife Ashley and her lover Brad Sidley in his apartment a few nights ago. Despite the tragic circumstances, I do not feel much remorse, because Ashley became unfaithful and mercantile after our marriage. In the next two weeks, I plan to start divorce proceedings based on adultery. Brad Sidley, whom I encountered physically twice, was not only a relative of Ashley, but also a vain man who often spoke out of place. Detective Roy Benson, an experienced investigator, was accompanied by a new member of the team, Detective Will Watson, who had many years of experience in the police. I have no idea how Watson was promoted to detective. He may be cute, and he talks incessantly, which some people find charming. But in my personal opinion, he's dumbed as a brick. My eyebrows shot up and I couldn't help but grin. Benson began by saying, So Lucas, it looks like you're ready to talk to us even in the presence of your representative. I interrupted him to clarify the situation. First of all, Detective Benson, we are not friends, so address me as Mr. Worthington. I started to speak. But Watson interrupted me with a giggle. Turning to him, I looked him straight in the eye and said, You know, Will, every time I see you, I think of the movie Menagerie. His face showed confusion, but I didn't let him answer before continuing. I remember one Vermeer saying to a flounder, You can't live your whole life fat, dumb, and ugly, son. Well, this quote is not entirely accurate. You remind me a lot of flounder. And to make our conversation easier, you'd better keep your mouth shut. Otherwise, I'll have to treat you the same way I did at school after football practice. It was a pleasant memory for me, but not a good one for Will. Watson called me names and pushed me in the locker room after practice. As a result, I was suspended from the game, but I don't regret it. Benson replied, That's not necessary, Mr. Worthington. I replied, then tell your dog to keep quiet. I wanted to give an explanation, but I didn't want to put up with his behavior. Watson seemed ready to confront me, but he didn't have the courage to do so. You may be wondering why I acted stupidly by provoking a policeman who was able to cause me trouble, but the justification for my actions will be revealed in due course. Benson muttered something to Watson, who leaned back in his chair, staring at me. Before I am interrupted, I would like to mention that this interview is being conducted solely because your department has agreed to record the entire conversation, and on the condition that if you deceive me at least once, it will be interrupted. Also, I ask you to ask questions right away, since I don't have time. We refuse to commit to a time frame, Benson said, clearly annoyed. It seems that you either did not talk to Chief Jackson or did not pay attention to him. Since I have already discussed and agreed on these terms with him, do you agree or should I leave? Benson and I exchanged glances for half a minute before he finally said, Okay, let's get started. I quickly took off my watch and set the timer to start. Benson began his interrogation by saying that Watson spoke to him only in whispers when he wanted to ask something. He knew I wouldn't answer any questions, so he didn't say anything. Despite the truthful answers to all the questions, it was obvious that they did not believe me. 
They couldn't prove that I killed my unfaithful wife and her lover. An hour later Watson, after whispering with Benson, asked, How do you explain that your DNA was found on the clothes you were sitting on? I stopped the timer on the watch, strapped it to my wrist, and said, This is your first and only lie. Goodbye. With that, I got up, and Ralph and I left. Benson and Watson shouted something as we left, but I ignored them and just continued on our way. We walked to Ralph's office, which was a short distance from the police station, and laughed several times along the way. Ralph laughed as we entered the secluded conference room. I can't decide who you are, the bravest or the stupidest client I've ever had, he remarked. I grinned back. Can I be both? I asked. Why were you so calm with the police, Lucas? Ralph asked. For two reasons, I replied. First of all, I did not commit a crime. And secondly, I have a reliable alibi, backed up by video recordings that cover the entire period of time when the murder could have occurred. According to the conclusion of the medical examiner, the time of death is between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon on the fifth of this month. The video in question was filmed at a basketball practice that took place in a city 90 miles away. The video captures the entire event, which began at 11 a.m., with an hour-long lunch break at 12.30 p.m. and ended before 4 p.m. The video was shot by a police videographer whom I hired for this training, as I plan to use this footage for presentations at various boys and girls clubs around the country, in connection with my charity work. I keep 12 copies in a safe at home. I will ask the legal assistant to accompany me to pick up a copy. Ralph chuckled. Only if you buy me lunch first. Working with Watson and Benson, I'm always hungry, I joked. Two days later at 6.30 a.m., Watson and a group of police officers showed up at my door with a search warrant. I was sure they were trying to disrupt my sleep, but I had been exercising for 30 minutes. Watson smirked smugly as he handed me the warrant. Enjoy yourself, you fool, I muttered, grabbing my bike to finish my outdoor workout. Don't even think about stealing anything. All valuables are documented in my inventory, Watson replied irritably. Fuck you, I replied. I had no problem letting them search my house for two reasons. I had nothing to hide and I discreetly installed high-tech cameras in every room, thanks to which I discovered Ashley's infidelity. I never told her about this evidence. When I returned from my bike ride, I found that the police had already left. Watson greeted me with a smile and handed me a bag of evidence, among which was a gun. Not being a gun owner, I knew it was planted, but I wasn't worried because the cameras would show it was planted. After spending an hour watching the footage from the cameras, I quickly called Ralph to bring him up to speed. I found out that they planned to arrest me within two days. Fortunately, Ralph's connections at the police station allowed us to warn about this. We arrived at the station just in time as the task force was preparing to arrest me at my charity event, and very publicly. We have already agreed with two local news stations that we will attend this event. They were furious that I had appropriated their success. I just grinned. Ralph had already asked Judge Ferris to schedule a bail hearing at a nearby courthouse the next morning. I spent only one night behind bars. They put me in a cell with a dangerous criminal named Melvin Brixey, probably hoping that he would harm me. But their plan failed for two reasons. I caught Alvin off guard by immediately telling him that I knew about the deal the police had made with him to attack me. As soon as I spoke to him, I made it clear that I was rich and successful and that I could provide him with the best criminal defense attorney in the county if he testified in my favor. I also warned him that if he refused, he would face my wrath and I would not back down until one of us was dead. Despite my intimidating size and background, Melvin surprisingly appreciated my bold and aggressive tactics. The next day, Ralph and I gathered for my bail hearing. I informed him that I would take care of Melvin's legal expenses and asked his senior partner, a criminal defense attorney, to meet with Melvin on the same day. I shook Melvin's hand in farewell, causing the two guards who accompanied me to stare at us in amazement. 
The hearing was also attended by the district attorney, who had known my father since his private practice days. It was an election year, and I thought he was a disgusting man who got his punishment. To secure his re-election, he exaggerated the importance of the case. His insulting remarks about me fueled my anger. But fortunately, Ralph remained calm and reasonably refuted the arguments of the district attorney, not stooping to his level. Ralph also drew attention to the possible consequences for my charitable activities in the event of my imprisonment, stressing that I do not pose a danger to escape. As a result, I was released on bail of $2,000 and forced to hand over my passport, but without a wrist monitor. Back at Ralph's office, we quickly developed our strategy, spending just over two hours on it. At the end, we exchanged satisfied smiles. Ralph wasted no time in instructing his technical expert to review the DVD with my alibi. We put the relevant surveillance footage in my house in a convenient format, taken during a police search, and Ralph quickly contacted witnesses confirming the alibi, advising them to cooperate less with the authorities. Ralph immediately filed a notice with the court stating that we declare our right to a trial within 90 days of my arrest, which is much faster than the prosecutor and the court usually consider. As a rule, criminal defendants prefer to delay the trial, especially if they are released on bail. Unlike many of the accused, I willingly communicated with media representatives and gave interviews to all reporters who asked for it. I tried to express my dissatisfaction with the district attorney and police detectives in all available media, on radio, television, newspapers, and social networks. I didn't hold back, calling the district attorney incompetent and demanding his resignation at the next election, as well as accusing the police detectives who handled my case of corruption and inefficiency. Although I knew that my comments could make many people angry, I stood by my opinion. My goal was clear, to appoint a female prosecutor, Suzanne Carney, to handle this case. Despite her youth, she was already experienced. She recently transferred to our office from a larger city after a difficult divorce, which I learned about from the internet. She was only a year older than me and by all accounts was stunning. Although she was undoubtedly smart and capable, the task of preparing a case in less than 90 days against the background of other responsibilities and a new work environment proved to be quite difficult for her. After holding the case for about two weeks, she asked for a plea conference with Ralph and me. Reluctantly, we agreed, primarily because I was curious to meet her. When we arrived at the office we found her accompanied by two assistant prosecutors, Benson and Watson, as well as a stylishly dressed young woman whose role remained a mystery to us because she was not introduced. Although Ralph and I remained polite, our conversation was minimal. Carney outlined the key points of her case, including the discovery of the murder weapon in my house during a search. The ballistics examination positively identified the weapon, and my DNA was found on it. In addition, the video recording of my alibi ended at 1.50 p.m., which gave me the opportunity to commit murder by 3 p.m as determined by the medical examiner. Carney pointed to a strong motive for the crime, calling Sidley and Ashley's affair a driving factor and suggesting that eliminating Ashley was a more cost-effective solution than divorce. And despite my previous disagreements with Sidley, in which she accused me of losing, the information was actually distorted by my friend. Despite this, thanks to her generosity, she agreed to find me guilty of manslaughter in the first degree, and sentenced me to prison for a term of 8 to 15 years. During her announcement, Ralph and I just smiled, as we had agreed earlier. Her actions seemed to have disturbed everyone present. After she finished speaking, I politely asked, Miss Carney, could we have a private meeting with you in private? This request surprised her team. Miss Carney hesitated and replied, I'm sorry but I can't agree to this. It would be unethical for me to talk to you without your lawyer present. However, Ralph intervened with a smile. Actually, Miss Carney, Mr. Worthington and I completely agree. There will be no ethical problems, and we are ready to provide signed statements to confirm this. After an awkward pause, I laughed a little and suggested, 
Why don't you call your secretary and dictate a statement to him? Then they can bring it here for Ralph and me to sign. Suzanne quickly called the secretary and handed over her instructions. While we were waiting for the document to arrive, I tried to maintain an easy and pleasant conversation, constantly smiling at Suzanne. Less than five minutes later, a male secretary entered the room with a document in his hands. After a quick glance at it, Ralph and I quickly signed the document. The secretary and one of the assistant prosecutors witnessed our signatures, after which the secretary left to make copies. When everyone else left the room, only Suzanne and I were left in it. As soon as the door closed behind them, I leaned over to Susanna and whispered, Since you're new here, you should know some things. Detective Watson is corrupt, and the district attorney, your boss, is incompetent. The continuation of this case will lead to complete disgrace for both the police and your office, and it will be almost impossible to recover from it. Your colleagues may not pursue your interests. Is there something you want to share with me? She asked, pouting. No, let the court deal with it if you decide to continue. I'm just warning you that everything is not what it seems, and you should carefully examine the discovered gun and my alibi. I don't want you to get involved in this. If you don't figure this out further, I recommend asking the district attorney to assign this case to someone else, I explained. What's it to you? She grumbled in displeasure. Because I care about you and I'm interested in starting a new relationship after the death of my cheating wife. I would like to get to know you better, I replied with a smile. Suzanne looked shocked and stared at me with her mouth open for two whole minutes. When she found her voice again, she asked, Are you sincere or is this a prank? I assured her of my sincerity by mentioning her favorite artist Bon Jovi. I explained that thanks to a friend, I was able to get front row tickets to his upcoming concert in New York, which will take place in 123 days. Inspired, I invited her to join me and took out my iPhone with a smile. After a minute's silence, she exclaimed, You're crazy. Just let me know if you will accept my plea offer before it expires today. Miss Prosecutor, I'm sorry if I upset you. Perhaps when you find me innocent, you will change your mind and I will show you kindness. But in answer to your question, I refuse your offer and all future plea deals because I am innocent. While she was sitting in a state of shock, I took the opportunity to take her hand, gave her a quick kiss, and left the room. When we left the building and walked past Watson, I couldn't resist giving him the middle finger. Ralph found it funny. How did it go? he asked. I explained that I had invited Bon Jovi to a concert in New York, and she declined my offer of a date at the concert, but showed interest in me. I'll ask her again after the trial, I said. Ralph wondered if she would talk to me again after what had happened. I replied optimistically, I hope so. Maybe she'll start to appreciate my sense of humor. Ralph laughed. I don't want to spoil the outcome of my trial for you in advance, but I have to say a few things. The DVD that we handed over to the prosecution with my alibi ends at 1.50 p.m., but if you keep playing it for another 30 minutes, it will resume at 1.50 p.m. and will show me until 4 p.m. If the prosecutor's office or the police had continued the playback, instead of interrupting it on static, they would have seen it. In addition, the prosecutor's office got the impression that Ashley and I did not have a prenuptial agreement. There was a secret witness, known only to my business lawyer Ralph, his girlfriend, who witnessed the signing, but she lived 2,000 miles away from us. We included her in a long list of witnesses, but the prosecution was unable to contact her. According to local regulations, we were not required to disclose information about what witnesses might say. Fortunately, we had a fair and impartial judge who, given the strong evidence in our case, would suit anyone. The jury selection process was completed quickly, in just two hours, much to the satisfaction of our consultant and Ralph. Although we were confident in our progress, there was no reason to abandon the selective approach to jury selection. The prosecution's arguments began with the fact that the medical examiner showed photographs of a brutal death describing in detail the time and cause of death. 
The highlights were two bullet wounds to the head of a 380 caliber bullet, and the fatal shot that led to Ashley's death, which occurred between noon and three o'clock on the fifth of the month. During cross-examination, Ralph focused solely on determining the specific time and circumstances of death. A police witness who assessed my financial situation testified about the possible financial consequences of divorcing Ashley, since adultery was not a valid reason for divorce, and there was no prenuptial agreement. Ralph gained a significant advantage in the case by presenting a prenuptial agreement, which stipulated a maximum payment of $50,000, and in case of infidelity, only $1,000. In addition, Ralph put the witness in an awkward position by asking if she had tried to verify the existence of a prenuptial agreement with her business lawyer, instead of relying only on Ashley's information. When she answered with a firm, no, it caused a wave of disgust among the jury. Suzanne invited a ballistics expert who confirmed with certainty that the 3080 80th caliber pistol found in my house was indeed used in the murder. In addition, a DNA expert confirmed that my DNA was present on the weapon. During cross-examination, Ralph pointed out that the ballistics expert was not present when the gun was found, and the DNA expert explained that there was no DNA on the bullets in the gun. She suggested that the DNA found on the weapon could have been injected in another way. Suzanne's confidence began to waver when she called her star witness, Detective Will Watson, and listened to his testimony about the search warrant for her home. Within 30 minutes, Corporal Cheryl Billings found the gun during a search, and Detective Watson took it with gloved hands and put it in an evidence bag, watching what was happening. His testimony was brief and lasted only about 20 minutes. During cross-examination, Ralph held the projector control panel in the courtroom and asked Detective Watson about his clothes on the day of the search, Ralph asked. Ralph presented a photo taken near my house during the search, which showed several police officers and a camera on the front door. In the picture, he saw me in dark blue trousers, a light blue long sleeve shirt, a pronounced red and yellow tie, black dress shoes, and a voluminous tweed sports jacket. Is this really your photo taken that day and showing off your outfit? Yes, Ralph said. I didn't ask if these were the right clothes, I just asked if your clothes were in this photo on the day of the search. If necessary, we can invite Corporal Billings or other officers to confirm. Watson replied angrily, Yes, that's exactly what I was wearing that day. I don't wear this tie very often. It's new, and I put it on because it was a special occasion. Detective Watson, Ralph growled, You've never visited the Worthington house except on the day of the search, right? After a short pause, Watson shifted in his chair and replied, No. Then Ralph turned on the video, which shows someone taking a green toothbrush from my bathroom and asked, Is that you with your distinctive yellow and red tie, Detective Watson? Embarrassed, Watson stammered, I've never seen this video before. Probably not, Ralph chuckled. Just answer the question. After a short pause, he replied, Yes. Similarly, he was asked if he was the one who took some red and white items from the laundry basket in my laundry room. After another delay, he admitted, yes. Finally, he was questioned about taking a gun from under my tweed jacket in the closet, brushing it with a toothbrush, rubbing it on a red and white shirt, and then putting it in the top drawer of the closet by the window. Watson was speechless as he watched the video playing on the screen. I declare my Fifth Amendment, he finally managed to say, his voice barely above a whisper. When asked if he had an affair with my wife, Ashley, Watson replied so quietly that the court reporter had to ask him to speak up. I affirm my right to the Fifth Amendment, he muttered. The video, filmed just two weeks before the murder, shows Watson and Ashley engaging in intimate activity in one of Mr. Worthington's guest bedrooms. After showing a recording of an intimate act for 15 seconds, the judge ordered the video to be turned off, stating that they understood what was being said. Answer the question, Detective Watson, the judge demanded. I declare my Fifth Amendment, he muttered. Ralph announced, there are no more questions, and all eyes turned to Suzanne as she rose from her seat. Your Honor, can we take a break? What is it? 
she asked. You definitely need it, Miss Corny. We will meet in two hours, the judge replied and struck with a hammer. The jurors reacted in different ways. Some smiled, others shook their heads. Detective Benson was in the courtroom, so I went up to him and asked, Are you planning to arrest Watson? He looked a little distant, but replied, I don't have a warrant. I pressed him, noticing, There are enough grounds to charge, maybe not with murder, but certainly with tampering with evidence. Surprised, he exclaimed, Murder? Who do you think is responsible for the deaths of Ashley and Seedley? This is the man who planted the murder weapon. Be brave, Benson, and arrest him, I said firmly. To my surprise, Benson nodded to the bailiff, and they quickly arrested him. During lunch, Susanna contacted Ralph to arrange a meeting. We expected her to drop the case, but to our surprise, she informed us that the district attorney had agreed to plead guilty to second-degree manslaughter and only two years in prison. I was filled with anger and screamed, So you're saying that idiot Watson who took my wife's life will only serve two years? Susanna replied shamefacedly, No, I'm offering this plea agreement because we suspect that you had some kind of connection with Watson. I was speechless. My anger was so intense that Susanna looked genuinely scared. If Ralph hadn't been there to hold me back with his strength and size, I might have lashed out at her in anger. Despite my inner determination never to harm her, outwardly I was seething with rage. Running out of the conference room, I couldn't resist shouting, Go to hell! Ralph managed to calm my rage by slyly remarking, Does that mean you won't take her to the Bon Jovi concert in New York? I stared at him for a moment, still overcome with anger, and then burst out laughing. When we reconvened after a two-hour delay, the judge called the lawyers to the podium, where they were having an animated conversation. Curious about the cause of the commotion, I asked Ralph, who informed me that the judge had assumed that Suzanne would dismiss the lawsuit on the grounds of bias. To the judge's surprise, Susan got to her feet and refused, despite being reprimanded. She insisted on acting the way the prosecutor wanted, I couldn't help but laugh at this situation. Then Susanna started calling the next witness. The witness told the detectives that Sidley attacked me, giving me a reason to take revenge. It became clear that things were taking a turn for the worse when Ralph didn't even need to be cross-examined during the interrogation. He just said, Detective Watson must have misinterpreted my words. In fact, I told him that although Sidley started the fight and hit Lucas first, Lucas defended himself. Sidley had to spend the night in the hospital. Suzanne contacted the videographer to discuss recording my alibi. After making sure that he was the official videographer of the police department of the city where my basketball clinic was held, she asked about physical evidence number 14. She asked if he had watched the video, to which he confirmed that he had. Suzanne then asked if the video was complete, which he also confirmed. But when she asked if the video showed that the accused, Mr. Worthington, was here until about 1.50 p.m., he replied in the negative. He stayed at this place until about 4 p.m., and we continued to talk to him until about 4.30 p.m., after which he left to drive 90 miles back home. The prosecutor expressed surprise, saying, What? I watched the DVD, which was suddenly interrupted at 1.50 p.m., after which the interference began. It looks like you didn't witness the interference and I'm not sure how it ended up on your copy of the DVD. If you watch it, you'll see that the recording lasts up to four hours. Suzanne handed the witness a remote control so that he could skip the interference and continue playing the rest of the video. She intervened when he reached three o'clock and told him to take a break, and she sat down at the table. Ralph then made the witness fast forward to the end of the DVD, showing the time at 4.01 p.m. The videographer then confirmed that he personally saw me at the event between 11 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. The prosecution presented all its evidence. Usually the judge sends the jury and the defense files a motion for a verdict. But the judge skipped this step and immediately turned to Mr. Boston with a proposal. He asked for a verdict of not guilty. The judge granted his request and dismissed the jury. Then she called Miss Carney into her office. The press was looking forward to the interview after the trial. 
Ralph stood on the steps of the courthouse and angrily expressed his displeasure with the prosecution, claiming that they had done me a great favor. He was sure that he knew the outcome of the case from the very beginning and accused the police and the prosecutor's office of bringing him to court at all. Despite the fact that he chose his words carefully, I was more direct. After our conversation, I boldly stated that anyone who supported a corrupt district attorney in the upcoming elections would be a fool, that Watson was the real killer, and that the police should conduct their own investigation. I also mentioned my intention to sue the district attorney for wrongful prosecution. The next day, a lawyer from Alpha filed a lawsuit, naming the district attorney, Suzanne, whom I considered heartless, and Detective Watson as defendants. The news spread like wildfire in the local media, forcing the district attorney and the police chief to flee. When I was finishing my job at a charity foundation where I had just run an after-school education program for children in need, a young woman whom I vaguely remembered approached me. Hello, Mr. Worthington. I'm Shirley Williams, she introduced herself, holding out her hand for a handshake. While we were exchanging pleasantries, I couldn't resist saying, I think I've seen you before, although I can't remember where exactly. Shirley nodded understandingly and explained, Yes, we may not have been formally introduced to each other, but I was present at your initial plea negotiations with Miss Carney, as well as at your trial. Everything is clear now. Despite the fact that her dress was open and her glasses were deliberately unattractive, I couldn't help but notice that she was attractive. When she turned to face me, she looked even more attractive. What do you have to do with my business? I asked, holding her hand for a moment longer than I should have. I recently graduated from the faculty of law I practice here as an observer. My internship ends next week. Miss Carney was too embarrassed to approach you herself. She asked me to talk to you, she continued. I offered to go to my office and we chatted as we drove from the recreation center to my building, where I supervised the extracurricular program. Once in my office, I invited her to sit down. She looked around and noticed, Your office is much neater and more beautiful than I imagined. I replied with a smile, I'm sorry to disappoint you. She smiled back and continued, The prosecution team sincerely apologizes for the errors of judgment that took place during the consideration of your case. But they are puzzled by the static emptiness on the DVD, presented as an alibi. Despite this confusion, would Miss Corney and all those involved in the case like to offer their sincere apologies for the mistakes they made? If the case had been investigated more thoroughly, it could have been resolved before the trial. It brought a smile to my face. Shirley hesitated before speaking. You're not going to make it easier for me, are you? I just smiled back. Shirley sighed. Miss Carney wants to know what she can do to get you to drop the lawsuit against her, she added. After a moment of silence, I asked, Why are you here and not her? Shirley explained, After your outburst in court, she is afraid to meet you face to face. I couldn't help but ask, Why was she so heartless before I ran into her? She should have gone to the district attorney and dropped the case immediately after Watson's testimony. Now that she has realized the situation, she sincerely apologizes. May I ask you a few questions? Feel free to decline the answer. You can also leave without explanation. Do you understand? Yes, she replied hesitantly. How old are you? 26. Are these glasses real? No. Why do you wear them? To distract unwanted attention from men. Do you currently have a partner? No. Are you straight? Yes. What are your plans for the future after the internship ends next week? I hope to get a position in the prosecutor's office, but if not, I will look for a job at the nearest law firm as I like its location. I already have two potential options. Do you have any plans for Saturday night? I don't have any plans at the moment. Maybe my roommate and I will go to a club. Could you tell me your personal mobile phone number? She quickly dictated her phone number. All questions were asked and answered impartially, without emotion or facial expressions. After a long pause, I instructed her to give Miss Carney a message. 
If you receive a job offer from the prosecutor's office, I will withdraw the lawsuit against her. In addition, inform the district attorney that in order to charge Watson with the murder of my ex-wife, and not only for the current falsification, a sincere public apology must be made. If you are offered a job in the district attorney's office, I will drop the case against him, I said. Shirley laughed softly. Are you teasing me? What is it? She asked. I replied, no way. Moreover, let me put it in writing. I typed out my statement, printed it out, signed it, and dated it. At the bottom, I added, otherwise we'll see you in court. I handed the paper to Shirley. She looked at him, smiled, and said, Thank you, Mr. Worthington, holding out her hand. I shook the object I was holding in my hand and said politely, You're welcome, Miss Williams. Watching from the window as she walked away from my house, I decided to call her. She took her mobile phone out of her purse pocket, checked who was calling, and answered with a smile, Shirley Williams. Hello, Miss Williams, I replied. This is Lucas Worthington. Is this Lucas Worthington, whom I just met? She asked, with a slight hint of amusement in her voice. I know you don't have any definite plans for Saturday night, so I thought we could have dinner together and go to the Mousetrap play at the Artists' Theater. This play is known as the longest in history. I saw her smile broadly through the window, and after a moment she replied, Yes, I agree, Mr. Worthington. Can we meet at the restaurant? Please send me your address, and I will pick you up on Saturday evening at 6.15 p.m., I suggested. Of course, she replied with a smile. When she hung up, I watched her typing quickly on her phone. A moment later, I received a message on my phone with her address and a smiling emoji. From the moment Shirley and I met on Tuesday until I came to pick her up on Saturday, I couldn't wait to see her again. After paying and receiving a comprehensive report from a private investigator, I discovered that Shirley is not another gold digger like Ashley. Moreover, I felt a connection with her during our short conversation. The report revealed that Shirley was having a hard time getting divorced in her first year of law school after her husband cheated on her. Despite these difficulties, she studied well, was engaged in charity work, and demonstrated all the qualities of a responsible citizen. It was obvious that she came from a respectable family in a high middle income area. One of them is a doctor, the other is an artist, two older brothers. One of them owns a business, and the other is a doctor. When I picked up Shirley, she looked amazing. She was dressed in low key but stylish clothes. She had light makeup, an attractive hairstyle, and no fake glasses. Before we left, I asked her to introduce me to my roommate. I talked to a neighbor and gave her two tickets to a concert that was taking place next weekend in a nearby hall. This gesture made an impression on both her and Shirley. Dinner with Shirley was like nothing I've ever experienced. While we were making small talk on the way to the restaurant, which, in my opinion, was the most expensive in our city, I couldn't even imagine what was waiting for us. A few minutes after we sat down at the table, Shirley casually mentioned that we didn't need to share basic information about each other. She explained that she was already well aware of my biography, thanks to the investigation conducted by the police and the prosecutor's office before my trial. And she was sure that I had also hired people who had thoroughly researched her background. Let's focus on what drives us, what brings us joy, on our life goals, on important details such as education level, family size, and more. I was a little dumbfounded, but not as much as I expected. The research I did on Shirley, combined with our detailed conversation during the hundred-minute dinner, helped me realize that I know her as intimately as I know any other person in my life. In order to get to the show on time, we decided to forego dessert. It wasn't a big sacrifice for us as none of us are big fans of sweets. The mouse trap. Agatha Christie's comedy mystery about a murder with an unexpected ending was a new experience for us. Despite the fact that we didn't know what to expect, we enjoyed the two-plus hours spent watching the play. When the performance came to an end, we looked at the clock and realized that it was almost 11 p.m. As Shirley became more accustomed to physical touch, I became more and more fascinated by both her physical beauty 
and her personality. When we got to my car, I asked a question. Do you want to go to a club or do something else? It's too early for us young 20-somethings to go home. She stared into my eyes with an intensity reminiscent of the gaze of a cobra or mongoose at its prey, taking her time to respond. Her unexpected answer in the form of a question was the most shocking moment of an unforgettable evening. She took a deep breath before asking, Have you ever engaged in intimacy on a first date? It took me a moment to process the question, but I didn't ask her to repeat it. Instead, I calmly replied, No, why are you asking? She explained, Well, we know each other almost as well as people who have been meeting every weekend for months. The only thing we don't know about each other is how compatible we are in the bedroom, or on the kitchen table, or in the pool. In general, you get it. I feel strongly attracted to you. If you feel the same way about me, let's make this the first night for both of us, she said with a stoic expression, and then smiled broadly. I moved closer to her, hugged her, and bit into her lips with a series of short kisses, each of which became more passionate than the previous one. The last kiss lasted for two whole minutes, confirming that she is not only an excellent kisser, but also a wonderful and attractive person. When we pulled away, I couldn't resist asking, Do you want to see my tattoos? She laughed and replied, Come on. Only fools rush into a serious relationship immediately after they end their partner's infidelity. Shirley went through a divorce, and I ended the relationship with more radical methods. It's clear that Shirley and I are not the wittiest people. When we arrived at my house, our physical interaction was surprisingly gentle. There was no passionate tearing of clothes, just a moment when we stood close and looked into each other's eyes. It was then that I discovered a genuine liking for Shirley's personality and appearance. Her body was flawless. All the parts that were visible in the clothes looked perfect, except for the buttocks. Nothing was too big or too small, which pleased me, as I preferred large and firm buttocks. Shirley carefully took off my shirt, not taking her eyes off me. While she was filming it, I decided to voice my wish. I want to make love to you on the kitchen table. Without hesitation, she replied, leaning over him or lying on him. And remember, you do all the work, she grinned. Without breaking the kiss, I led her into the kitchen, occasionally bumping into the walls, as my eyes were almost closed. Fortunately, there were only documents and a few stainless steel objects on the table, which I quickly brushed away with one hand. I gently put her down on the table and stopped the kiss. When our eyes met again, I tried to put my hand under her dress to take off her underwear, but it was nowhere to be found. You're a sly one, aren't you? I teased earning her a smile. Hell yeah, she replied with a smirk. I set about the planned task gently and affectionately. Moving away from the climax, she whispered, I thought you wanted to make love to me. Feeling a little hungry, I suggested a snack first. You're a jerk, she exclaimed, sitting down and unbuckling my belt. I bent down to kiss her again. The closeness with her was just incredible. After a while, we both realized what we were doing. To bed, she said simply. I quickly took off my shoes, trousers, boxers, and one sock. And she easily took off her dress and unbuttoned her bra. She wrapped her arms around me and I kissed her, occasionally bumping into the walls as we went up to my bedroom. What started as an unplanned decision ended with us spending the whole weekend together. Shirley was a fantastic partner in bed, and we could explore all our desires together without any problems. Outside of the bedroom, she was even more amazing than I could have imagined. She was cheerful, affectionate, playful, and it was easy to talk to her on a variety of topics, from the mundane to the profound. When we sat down for breakfast at the same table where we had shared intimate moments just a couple of days ago, a memory of our conversation in the office suddenly popped into my head. In between eating a cheese omelet, I asked, Since we had such a great time this weekend, I completely forgot to ask if you passed on my suggestions to Suzanne? After taking a bite of the English muffin, she nodded and replied, 
Suzanne was very pleased and assured me that I would be offered a full-time job next week. She took another bite of the pie and added, but she also warned me not to mention it to the jerk. Everyone, including him, knows that he's going to lose the election because of you, and he might postpone my job offer if I blab about your offer. In addition, she believes that he will never apologize and intends to continue the lawsuit against him. I nodded in approval and understanding, enjoying the meal. It's funny that Suzanne asked about your personal interest in her. Despite your attack on her on the last day of the trial, she seems to be optimistic about the possibility of a romantic relationship. Upon receiving this remark, she smiled slyly at me. I smiled back. That's not going to happen. I found someone better. I smiled as I finished my breakfast. When she stopped in front of Shirley's house, she opened up to me more than to anyone else. So, Lucas, we've only known each other for a few days, but it's already clear that in and out of bed, we communicate like no other. Have you ever thought about what you would do if you were incredibly smart? She laughed and then bit into my lips with a quick but sincere kiss. You would probably suggest that I move in with you for the weekend so that after a few months of living together we could get engaged. After kissing me again and smiling, she left the room, her firm and slender back swaying as she left without looking back. I thought about this scenario for a moment before taking out my cell phone. I dialed Summer 1 in my contacts, and when Shirley answered the phone, I told her that I had a new idea. Why don't you come stay with me next weekend? I suggested it. Shirley was surprised and asked why I made such an offer. I've been thinking about it a lot, I assured her. After some hesitation, she agreed, but with a playful condition. I would have to pay her part of the rent, since Judy would not be able to pay. She giggled and hung up, leaving me thinking, a cunning woman. Sitting in the courtroom I couldn't help but grin. I was thinking about how stupid we started a relationship, but miraculously everything turned out for the best. She, a stern prosecutor, accepted my charity work with open arms, and everything seemed to fall into place. But it was one moment that became the real embodiment of the essence of our relationship. When Shirley Worthington, eight months pregnant, delivered a convincing closing speech at the trial of Will Watson in the murder of Ashley Worthington and Brad Sidley. In her last words, she managed to convince everyone that Watson had feelings for Ashley, was furious about her affair with Sidley, and eventually plotted Sidley's murder, trying to manipulate her and frame me. Unfortunately, he was careless in his actions, as a result of which, during an argument, a stray bullet accidentally hit Ashley, killing her. After the jury left the courtroom, I hugged Shirley warmly, kissed her on the cheek, and gently stroked her stomach, expressing my pride in her. When we returned from afternoon tea, it had been only an hour since the jury had started. Shirley was informed that the verdict had been reached when the sergeant major announced, guilty on all counts. I stood on the sidelines, watching Shirley graciously accept congratulations from others, even from members of the opposing counsel. When it was my turn to congratulate her, I quietly told her, tonight I'm going to pamper you with a relaxing bubble bath. I'll order your favorite dish from the best Italian restaurant in town. I'll give you a foot massage and then we'll make love. Shirley smiled, kissed me and replied, Sounds like a great plan. I am Albert Kraft, a business manager at a financial firm. I recently celebrated my 32nd birthday and have been happily married to my wife Maria for eight and a half years now. There are two boys in our family, six-year-old Danny and seven-year-old Kenny. We live in a spacious house in the suburbs near Atlanta. There is a large group of friends living in our neighborhood and we spend most of the weekends visiting someone at parties or barbecues. In the early years of our marriage when we lived elsewhere I had many friends, but Maria did not particularly like most of them. They were not as sophisticated as our current circle and cared more about personal qualities rather than material goods. It was a strong company that loved to communicate, but at the same time was incredibly generous and ready to help those who needed it. When Maria decided that we needed an update, she decided that it was time for a change. 
In a more elite area, we encountered the first serious disagreement. Our house was only a 15-minute drive from our place of work, and was designed in such a way that it allowed us to make acceptable mortgage payments. I have always been a calm person, not too concerned about material benefits, unlike my wife, who was constantly striving for updates. At first I did not accept Maria's offer to move, but after a week of hesitation, I gave up. After all, most things aren't worth arguing over whether it's a car, a house, or clothes. These are just material things that, after all, don't mean much. So when Maria reared up, I just brushed her off. It was pointless to argue with her. In fact, I can't remember a single argument that Maria and I had in the last eight years, until last night. Maria works in an interior design studio run by her neighbor. Her work schedule is from 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, so that she can take the children to school in the morning and return home in time for their return from school. I work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. due to traffic jams. I usually arrive home around 5.45 p.m. In our previous house, I was usually at home and enjoying a drink by 5.15 p.m., but last Tuesday evening there was an accident on the road which delayed my arrival until almost 6.15 p.m. By the time I got to my front door, I was feeling a little tense. But I brushed it off, grateful that I was finally at home and able to relax with my wife. I slipped out the back door and went upstairs to change into shorts and an old t-shirt. As I was walking down the stairs towards the kitchen, I heard Maria talking on the phone. Don't worry, Peg. You know Albert, he will agree with everything I say, Maria reassured her sister. No, he won't be angry. I think I understand my husband better than you do. I found out everything and I plan to discuss it with him after dinner tonight. I'll call you later and let you know about his reaction. Well, I have to go. Dinner won't finish itself. We'll talk later, Maria said, hanging up the phone. What do we need to talk about? I asked, coming around the corner. Albert, you scared me, Maria said when I came into view. Let me ask you one more time. What do we need to discuss, and what can wait until dinner? I asked, taking a beer from the fridge and sitting down at the kitchen table. Let's wait until dinner when the boys will be upstairs. So, what were they doing this time? I talked to them about going karting and not hitting golf balls in the backyard. What else could they have been doing since Saturday afternoon? It's not about the boys, it's about us, the wife replied. Well, I haven't done anything wrong since I playfully grabbed your buttocks at Frank's Grill last Friday night. And the only reason I did it was because you looked so stunning in your new jeans, so it must be you. What did you buy this time? I asked, trying to defuse the situation. That's not what I'm talking about, it's about how we feel about each other, she began. Well, darling, you know that I love you and I know that you love me. So what's the matter? I asked. Albert, I know that you love me. She said, holding my hands in hers. But I'm not sure I still love you. What? I don't understand, Maria, I told her, not understanding what this conversation was leading to. If you have something to say, just say it. You're the best and most caring husband in the world and a great father, she said touching the side of my cheek. But I'm not sure I feel the same way about you as I did when we got married. Maria said this with a worried expression on her face. I'm thinking about a preliminary breakup to sort out my feelings, she finally exhaled. Maria, this is all a bit unexpected for me. When did it all start? Before or after we said goodbye this morning? I asked, trying to make sense of her words. I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I wanted to make sure before bringing up this topic, Maria explained. I'm not sure I understand. What exactly are you suggesting? I asked. I think you could stay with your mother for a while. After her father's death, she was left alone in this big house. Maybe she'll appreciate the company? Maria spoke in a condescending tone, as if addressing a child. I felt anger rising in me, but I held it back. How will you manage the house and everything else if I leave? I asked, anticipating her answer. You'll still have to handle the payments, but it's temporary. Until I sort it out, she reassured me in a soft and caring tone. 
I stood up abruptly. No. What is there in the word no that you don't understand? I asked, catching Maria off guard with my unexpected defiance. I'm not moving in with my mom, and no, I'm not leaving my house and my two sons. If you need to leave to collect your thoughts, go ahead. I don't want to see you here either, if you don't love me anymore, as you so eloquently put it. So since I'm a great guy, I'll even help you pack up. I said that, put the beer on the table and went up the stairs to her bedroom. Maria was shocked to the core when I returned downstairs with an armful of clothes from her closet. Put it in your car. I'll be down with the next batch in a minute, I said, throwing my clothes on the sofa in the living room and heading back up the stairs. When I returned with another armful of things, Maria started screaming at me to stop. I thought you wanted to break up. I'm just helping you carry things out, I calmly informed her. At that moment, my emotions switched from love to resentment for her. I was entering the realm of hate, or what I now called the dark side. I want you to leave, Albert, she screamed at me. That's not going to happen, Maria, I answered firmly. This is my house, and I haven't done anything that you or the kids could kick me out for. But if you prefer to move to the basement, I can help you move your things there. While I was unloading another armful of clothes on the sofa, it became clear that Maria's plan was not unfolding as she had hoped. She expected me to leave quietly and without resistance. What should I do now? She muttered to herself, clearly flustered by my unexpected reaction. Ignoring her hesitation, I continued. Let's talk about this in an adult way, Maria. Then I added, I think you've said everything you wanted to say. I finally understood your true feelings for me. Make a decision. Where should I put your clothes? You definitely can't stay in my bedroom anymore, I said, trying to keep my composure. When our sons Danny and Kenny entered the room, they asked about the situation. Mom is just rearranging things, that's all. Why don't we go get some burgers and give her some time to finish? I didn't have to ask twice. We left and returned with food in just 45 minutes. But when we returned, we found unexpected guests. Getting out of the car and telling my sons to go inside, I greeted two policemen who drove up to my house. Good evening, officers. How can I help you? I asked. The larger of the two officers said they had received a call about a domestic dispute and needed to talk to me. He put his hand on the gun, but I assured him, Officer, you won't need this, and told him about the situation I found myself in at home. I explained that although I did not raise my voice and did not threaten anyone, I made it clear to my wife that I did not intend to leave my house. I stressed that my name is on the mortgage, I pay all the bills, and if there is no court order, I have every right to be there. I am sure that I have the right to be here, despite my doubts. I informed my wife that if she was unhappy with me, she could leave, and I would help her pack her things, I told them. They both giggled finding humor in my situation. Maria became visibly angry when the police informed her that they could do nothing. They said they would file a statement that I was calm and not threatening anyone, and Maria loudly expressed her displeasure and used obscene language while discussing her husband. I just wanted to help my wife load her personal belongings into the car. That's all anyone saw. After thanking them and shaking their hands, they wished me luck. Maria was furious that she had failed to get her way. Albert, just go away and make life easier for everyone, she screamed. I stood my ground and told her that this was not the way out. I gave her a choice. Her things could be in the car or in the basement. The boys and I decided to eat on the terrace while she makes a decision. After taking the food, I carefully considered my next steps and went out onto the terrace, where my boys were eagerly waiting. What's wrong with mom? One of them asked. Who knows? Maybe she had a hard day at work, I replied, trying to calm them down. Let's leave her alone. She'll be the same again soon. Deep down, I didn't believe a word I said. We ate with pleasure and then sat down to watch a special edition about the X Games taking place in Atlanta. It wasn't until almost 8.30 p.m. that we finally finished. I told the children to go upstairs and find out what was going on with their mother. I'll come up later to check on you, 
I assured them. While they were going upstairs I went in search of Maria. To my surprise, she was nowhere to be found, and her clothes were in a pile on the couch where I left them. When I entered the bedroom, I noticed that several drawers were open, and two suitcases were missing. It was clear that she had left. Sitting on the bed, I thought about what would happen next. Just now, at 7.15 a.m., I left my loving wife and family, and now, at 9 p.m., everything has changed. I was left with two boys, but without a loving wife. Sometimes life can be very hard. Mom, I need a big favor, I said, dialing my mother's number. I briefly explained the situation and asked her to come over to make sure the boys would go to school on time and be taken care of when they returned home. Maybe Maria's hormones are just not right. Maybe she'll come back when she realizes her mistake, Mom suggested. I was grateful to my mom, but deep down I wasn't as optimistic as she was. And unfortunately, I was right. Maria did not return on Wednesday or Thursday, but on Thursday afternoon she called the boys to greet them, but she didn't contact me. By Saturday morning, I was worried and angry. I started blaming myself, saying, You have no one to blame but yourself. If I hadn't been so passive all these years, Maria wouldn't have tried to kick me out of her own house. Now she's sulking at her parents' house and spreading rumors about how insensitive I am that I don't take her feelings into account. I can't stand her in this damn house, I muttered, looking around the rooms around me. His size was too big for the four of us. On Sunday afternoon, Maria's sister Peggy came to pick up her things. Hi, Peg, I greeted her when she came in. I thought Maria would send you to get her things. You know Maria, Peggy replied with a grin. She still can't understand why you fell for her demands. I warned her that you wouldn't agree, but she insisted that she knows you better than I do. It turned out that she was wrong, Peggy said. I should have kicked her out the door, but I chose to keep the peace in the family by keeping silent. Obviously, it was a mistake. Do you know when she plans to return? I asked. I have no idea. She's still at the rebellious stage, but mom is ready to kick her out if she doesn't clean up, Peggy replied. Would you like to join us for dinner? We're cooking grilled chicken, baking potatoes, and cooking corn on the cob, I asked Peggy, deciding to change the subject. As soon as I pack her things, we'll decide, she replied with a grin. The boys were glad to see Peg, and we enjoyed dinner together. Despite the fact that Maria received two text messages asking for her whereabouts, she chose not to respond. Having cleaned herself up, at almost 8 o'clock she said that it was time for her to leave. We thanked her for the visit, because it was nice to see a familiar face. Don't hesitate to ask for help if you need anything, she said goodbye. I warned my sister that she was jeopardizing her happy marriage, but her friends advised her not to give up and wait for you to come to your senses. I insisted that you would not come to this, and it seems that you were right. When Peg hugged me, kissed me on the cheek and left, I couldn't help but think that I had married the wrong sister. The next three weeks were difficult. Mom looked after the children, and although Maria talked to the boys, she avoided talking to me. She sent me two long letters in which she talked about how unwell she felt, criticized me for not supporting her as a husband, and gave other negative comments. What caught me off guard was that I was no longer invited to our neighborhood get-togethers, but Maria was still invited. It seemed that the sides had already been chosen. The children noticed this change and constantly asked when their mother would return home. I explained to them that it was ultimately her decision. On Saturday morning, we went grocery shopping. My life changed dramatically when I walked down the aisle with my two sons. Out of nowhere, someone grabbed me from behind and yanked me off the floor. You're so stupid that you're probably stroking her shorts right now, a voice from the past mocked me. If it's as high as you can lift me, then you're still that piece of shit that was always out of shape. I'll never know what Carol sees in you, I said with a laugh. I thought you had disappeared from the face of the earth. What, are you too good for us now that you have this big house? Randy asked, setting me down on the ground. I've always been too good for you, I replied. You didn't notice, I said, hugging him. 
Your boys are really growing up fast. It's been about two and a half years, right? I asked. How are Carol and the girls? Are they still bossing me around like they usually do? I joked. And Maria? I hesitated for a moment before replying. She's doing very well. He laughed. So bad, huh? Hey, if you and your new fashionable friends don't have any plans for the evening, I'll have a little meeting and I'll be glad if you join us. When? I asked, looking at the boys. Any time after four o'clock, he replied. Maria must still let you drink beer, he chuckled. So this is a date, huh? Randy confirmed it, grinning. Do I need to take anything with me? I asked. No, just myself, Randy replied. Well, I'd better go before Mom makes a scene for me, he added and headed back to the exit. Was that Uncle Randy? My two boys asked with their eyes wide open. Yes, it was Uncle Randy, I confirmed. We need to hurry up. I don't want to be late for the party. We arrived at Randy's a little after 4.30 p.m. After Carol hugged me warmly, her daughters quickly took my boys to the backyard. Where is Maria? Carol asked. It's a long story, I replied. Well, I'm just grateful that you and the boys are here, Carol said. And indeed, everyone was glad to see us. The group greeted us as if we had never left. The children and I had a great time getting the most out of the evening. When the evening came to an end and most of the guests had left, Carol, Randy, and I finally sat down at the table. They were interested to know what happened between Maria and me. I could only shake my head and admit that I didn't understand anything. We have never had any disagreements or quarrels. I explained that maybe that was the problem. I let her behave in such a way to keep the peace in the family. I thought Maria was happy because we were close, and I thought everything was fine, but I didn't know. Carol suggested that this might be a typical feminine trait, but I countered that it wasn't just that. There is no point in telling your spouse that you love him, but you are not in love with him. It's just a confusing double speech. I never considered the possibility that Maria could cheat, but now I can't rule it out. I will remain vigilant, silent, and watch how events unfold. I'm tired of being a good guy. It's time to prioritize myself and my kids and forget about everyone else, including my bosom friends in the neighborhood. Peggy came by every Sunday to pick up Maria's clothes, and I was surprised to find that I was looking forward to her visits. On Saturday mornings, I took my boys to Maria's mom in the hope of talking to her. But after our first fight, I realized that it was easier to just drop them off and leave. This way I can avoid further collisions on the lawn in front of the house. My emotions went from anger to submission, and then I finally fell into depression. It was like I was going through a seven-step program for alcoholics. I even tried to communicate with Maria weekly by email, expressing my love and longing for her. But unfortunately, I did not receive any response. I ask you for patience, my love, she wrote. I am working on solving these constant problems so that they do not arise in the future. I understand how stressful this is for you and the boys, but please be patient a little longer, she assured. Her words gave a glimmer of hope. Three months later, when I was washing the dishes on Sunday, Peggy struck a blow to my heart. Maria went on a date last night, she said, not meeting my gaze. And it wasn't the first one, she added. I called her crazy, but she went anyway. I think you should know, she concluded, still avoiding eye contact. I stood silently, holding a soapy washcloth in my hands, which dripped onto the floor. Peggy's words cut through the air as she demanded an answer. She went on a fucking date, do you hear me? She repeated with obvious disappointment. She repeated, her disappointment obvious but I froze in place, unable to grasp the reality of what was happening. For the first time since Maria's departure, I seriously thought about life without her. I was angry at times, but I always kept the hope of reconciliation. Now, faced with the possibility that she might never come back, I was speechless and felt insecure. Albert, are you with me? Did you hear what I just said? Peggy's voice was full of urgency, as she pounded on my chest. I shook my head trying to clear my mind. My wife betrayed me, 
and I could only stand there in shock. Peggy's words finally broke through my stupor, and I grabbed her hands, pulling her to me. Tears filled my eyes as I felt her pain repeat my own. It's not fair, she whispered, hugging me tightly to her. And suddenly the unfairness of it all overwhelmed me. With a cry of frustration, I threw the washcloth at the wall, unable to contain my anger any longer. I screamed when the children entered the room, curiously watching the commotion. Dad, what's going on? They asked. Peggy slipped on the floor and I hit my knee trying to catch her. It's all right, I reassured my sons. Don't forget, we still need to watch a movie and we're waiting for you too. They reminded and headed back to the living room. Peggy and I sat on the couch, and my boys sat in front of the projection TV. Having already watched Spider-Man 3 twice, I knew that they had seen it at least six times, but we all sat in silence, absorbed in the film. I'm so sorry, Peggy whispered, squeezing my hand gently. Still feeling disoriented, I fell into gloomy thoughts. In my head I began to develop a strategy for the future. So far I have not sought revenge, but I have focused on self-defense. When the movie was over, I put the kids to bed and walked Peggy to the door. Are you okay? What is it? She asked. No, but I can handle it, I replied. Feel free to contact me if you need anything or just want to chat, she offered, kissing me on the cheek. You know she's stupid, Peggy remarked as she left. Call me on Monday. I decided to take a day off from work and asked for a vacation. After sending the children to school, I sat down at the computer to solve some financial issues. I paid off the debt on our two Visa credit cards and closed the accounts. Then I went to the bank and transferred 50% of the remaining funds to a new account issued exclusively in my name. The bank informed me that it would take six business days to delete my name from existing accounts. In addition, I contacted the Human Resources Department at my workplace to exclude Maria from the life insurance policy, as well as from the medical and dental insurance policy. By 11.30 a.m., I alone successfully changed the locks in the house, updated the security codes on the front door and on the garage opener. I also went to the mall to cancel my cellular plan, for which, unfortunately, I had to pay $250. I opened a new data plan in my own name only, anticipating Maria's reaction when she tries to use her own phone. This thought brought a smile to my face, the first one in a while. I decided to leave the home phone number unchanged, but left a message on the answering machine. I asked Maria to contact me and gave her parents' home phone number. The children, as usual, rushed into the house. Guys, I need your old house keys. I changed the locks, here are your new keys, I said, handing each of them a new key and throwing the old ones in the trash. After completing this task, I thought, everything is ready. It took only eight hours to transform from a happily married husband to a single parent. I knew the storm was inevitable. In the evening, the home phone rang. What are you up to, Albert Kraft? She demanded an answer. My cell phone and credit cards are blocked and I need you to explain your behavior. Maria only called me by my full name when she was furious. It took me only eight hours to upset her, while it took me three months to reach my limit. Peggy called and said she'd be right over and invite us all to dinner. When she arrived, I hurried to collect the children. She urged us to hurry up, and the children ran to the door. What's the rush? I asked. Maria and her parents will come for a serious conversation with you. If you want to avoid unnecessary nonsense, come with me, she replied to me. In the end, we went to Sonny's barbecue. Not my first choice, but Peggy and the kids voted. Despite my initial doubts, we enjoyed the food and had a great time. You know I changed the locks, right? I asked realizing the scale of the actions taken after the cancellation of credit cards, mobile phone, and insurance. She informed my parents that you had emptied both your checking and savings accounts. Dad was furious, Peggy said. I only took half but not before I paid off all the credit card debts she had accumulated over the past three months. I spoke. She has a talent for spending money. 
I suspected but you know dad. He always defended his daughters, even when they were wrong, Peg confessed to me. What are you going to do next? What is it? She asked. Nothing, I replied. Nothing, Peggy asked. Except to put this terrible house up for sale. I despise this place from the very beginning, I replied. Even if we reconcile in the future, I will insist on selling the house. You can't do this without her permission, you know, Peg reminded her. But when the announcement of the sale comes out, all the neighbors will probably talk about it, I said with a big smile. We spent almost three hours together, but it was already late and it was time for the children to go to bed, so we decided to go home. Are you and mom getting divorced? My children asked when I put them to bed. We asked mom and she said no, but she doesn't live here anymore. I can't give a definite answer right now. Mom and I take great care of you, but I don't believe she wants to continue living with me. We'll have to wait and see what she decides. I wish them both a good night, expressing my love and assuring them that everything would be fine. I opened a beer and handed one to Peggy as we sat down at the kitchen table. You know you can't avoid this forever, Peggy said. I don't plan to. She knows where I live and work so it won't be difficult for her to find me. And in the end, she did it. On Thursday at work, Maria burst into my office. How could you cancel my credit cards and cell phone? She exclaimed. And when did you change the locks in the house? Maria asked questions. Hi Maria, you look great. How are you? I asked, and without waiting for an answer, continued for her. Me? Oh, I'm fine. The boys really miss the fact that you don't live with us. Yes, I lost a few kilograms. Thank you for noticing, Maria continued, leaving me in amazement. Maria, what are you talking about? About what? I asked. If you want to discuss the situation calmly, I'm ready to do it. But if you raise your voice and make scandals, I will have to kindly ask you to leave, because this is a professional environment, I told her. Maria sat down in front of my desk, and I asked, Why did you make such a choice last week? Why are you dating someone else even though we're still married? It was just a dinner with a friend, nothing more, Maria explained. Was there anything else? I asked. No, there was nothing. It was just dinner, she assured. Will anything happen in the future? I asked. Why are you bombarding me with questions, Albert? What is it? She asked irritably. I just want to know your schedule, I clarified. What's the schedule? Maria asked. Our divorce, I said, shocking Maria. I don't want to get divorced, Maria shouted back. Well, you certainly show all the signs that you want him. Dating, ignoring family, buying underwear for someone else. It's obvious that you want to move on without us, I accused. I still see the credit card bills, Maria. I know what you're buying, but I don't know for whom, I added. I don't want to get divorced. All I need is to be alone, she repeated for the tenth time. I wasn't going to let her out of my sight this time. What time is it, Maria? How much more do you need, I asked. I don't know. How can I give you an answer if I don't know myself? She replied. Well, when you understand everything, please let me know. But it has to happen soon if you want to save this marriage, I said, getting up. I still have work to do and a meeting in 20 minutes, so if you don't mind. She tried to kiss me goodbye, but I dodged by turning my head. She looked displeased but didn't say anything. I finished the story and looked at Peg. Later that evening, Peg and I had a long conversation. How long are you going to pretend this marriage is real? What is it? She asked. This weekend, I replied. If Maria is not back by Saturday morning, I will go to a lawyer. I confessed to Peg that if Marie didn't come back by then, she probably would never come back. I decided not to tell the children anything, because my mother planned to pick them up from the city on Friday after school. I'll have an answer by the end of the week, I offered. Peg looked very upset by my answers. The evening with Peggy was quite restrained until she suddenly said that she had to go. I walked her to her car and held her for a moment before she got in. As she drove away, I bent down and kissed her goodbye. 
In the evening, I sent Maria a laconic letter. It said that if she was not fully ready to return and become the wife and mother of our children, then I would end our relationship. The ultimatum was delivered. The moment of making a decision has come. On Tuesday evening, Maria called and said she was coming back. She mentioned that she took the day off on Friday so that we could have the whole night to talk. I felt joy and sadness at this news. The days leading up to Friday seemed to drag on forever. Maria called me daily, as did Peg. Peg mentioned how glad Maria was to be back home and wished us both well. Finally, on Friday evening, I arrived home and found Maria waiting for me with a glass in her hands. I immediately hugged her, feeling a strange feeling after four months of separation. We sat down at the table to eat together. We talked for several hours, both realizing the inevitability of this. When I was lying in bed, she came out of the bedroom with no clothes on. Maria, before you come to me, I need to know something, I began. How long has this affair been going on? Please spare me the excuses that it was a one-time thing. Maria looked away and confessed. It's been six months, but now it's over. I broke up with him a long time ago, she said with an expression of fear. So basically you left because you wanted to be with him, right? I asked a question. At first it was the reason. Therefore I needed to be alone to understand who I really need, Maria replied. And now you think you can come back into my life like nothing happened after you've been with him all this time? Do you expect me to just forgive and forget? Albert, did you date anyone else while I was gone? Maria asked. We're discussing that you've had a lover for the last six months, I reminded her. How can you be so cocky? She replied. Unlike you, I stayed true to my oath, I declared, getting out of bed. Now that I know the truth about the liar I married, I can finally make the difficult decisions I've been avoiding for so long, I replied angrily. Albert, I didn't come back to you to end everything. I admit my serious mistake and am not proud of it, but I'm begging you for forgiveness and one more chance. I love you and I desperately want to rebuild our family. Please give me one more opportunity, Maria begged. What was I supposed to say when she presented it to me like this? No? I need time to figure things out, Maria, but I can't do it lying next to you. I'm too angry right now. Just reassure me that it wasn't one of our friends or colleagues, was all I could say. I asked, and she confirmed that it was someone from work and that it was over, repeating it a second time. I spent Friday and Saturday nights in the spare room. It was lonely, but I had to make a difficult decision to move on. We spent the whole weekend talking. She encouraged me to ask any questions and I promised to answer truthfully. I regret my past actions. At that time, excitement and neglect made me make the wrong choice. But I've since realized that it was a mistake. What's done is done, and dwelling on past mistakes will lead to nothing. All I can do now is to learn from my own experience. I want our relationship to develop in a healthy and honest way. If you are ready, I hope we can restore trust through open communication and respect. The future is not written, and I believe that two caring people can overcome past difficulties if they decide to approach them with understanding," Maria said regretfully. By Sunday morning, my mind was full of various worries, and I desperately needed to rest. Dinner at her mother's house had been missing for months, but it was a welcome change. Her mother had prepared a feast, and despite the cheerful atmosphere, Peggy, her mother, and I seemed to be in a gloomy mood. When we were about to leave, her mother hugged me, put something in her pocket, and quietly asked me to call her the next day, after which she kissed me on the cheek. The next two weeks passed in chaos. I continued to sleep in the spare room, and the children were glad that Mom had returned to their house. On Friday, I left work early to sort out some things that couldn't be done after hours. In order not to be distracted, I turned off my mobile phone. When I finally turned it back on, I was surprised to find 12 missed calls from Maria. When I was sitting with a beer, she burst into the room, waving an envelope and demanding to explain why I filed for divorce. Confused, I asked why she thought we would try again, to which she replied with anger and disappointment. We were so close, Maria, I replied. But that was when it was just the two of us, I told her. 
Now we have no hope. I turned to a shocked Maria, who was sitting in an armchair. You see, I was leaning on your side because of the children and all those good moments that we had in the past. But two weeks ago, something new turned out that put our marriage in jeopardy. How did you know? No one knew, she replied. Does it matter how I found out, Maria? So you were going to trick me like a naive fool and make me believe. You're really lying, Maria. I didn't want this to happen. I'm really sorry, Albert. I don't have any feelings for him, just for you. We can fix everything and get back to the old relationship, she pleaded. He offered me money so that I would settle everything quietly so that his wife would not find out anything. I'm only making the situation worse with every word I say. I hope that you, he, and his wife will find happiness. I love you, Albert. I really do. We can get through this. Maybe even sell this house and start all over again in a new place. But Maria, it's over between us, I replied. We broke up a long time ago, although it was hard for me to admit it. For the sake of our children, you can stay here until the house is sold or you find a new place to live. I intend to take the children with me, but you can see them whenever you want. I don't need anything from you except for you to disappear from my life, I informed her. She cried the rest of the weekend, and when I picked up the kids, we had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Although they weren't completely shocked by our breakup, they were still upset. After all, she was their mother. We split everything equally, and even after covering all the expenses, I managed to save enough money to make a down payment on a modest house in a more favorable area. Maria settled her issue, and I granted her request to keep it confidential. That Sunday, Maria's mother discreetly put something in my jacket pocket, and that changed everything. The next day, I contacted her mother to clarify the contents of what she had given me. Reluctantly, she began, I shouldn't reveal this, but if I don't, you may never know the truth. One morning after Maria moved out, I found something in the guest bathroom, and it took me a few days to get up the courage to tell you about it. You see, I found a pregnancy test in the trash that indicates that someone in the house is expecting a baby. Since Maria was the only woman in the house, it had to be her. I didn't want to break the bad news, but I think Maria might have been trying to trick you. Just remember that you didn't hear it from me, okay? What are you talking about, Mom? I asked, confused. I don't want to upset you, Albert, she said. Before she hung up, she informed me that Maria was expecting a baby. The news would have been more dramatic if I had discovered a pregnancy test, read a doctor's report, or found her in a compromising situation. But in the end, her own mother told her everything. The house I came across was not far from the one where Maria and I lived a long time ago and needed major repairs. The house had four bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms, a spacious patio, but unfortunately there was no pool. Fortunately, the children helped, and my new assistant became a real salvation. After the divorce was finalized, we gathered at Maria's mom's house for Thanksgiving, and the children excitedly told us the details about our new home. They said they each had their own bedroom and bathroom, and Kenny exclaimed, This is so great! Danny has his own room, I have my own, and Dad and Aunt Peggy have their own. We still have one room left for guests who can stay with us, he said with a proud smile. I was even able to choose the color of the walls and finishes, he added. Maria asked her son to come back for a while. Is this your room, Danny's room, a spare room, and someone else's? What is it? she asked. Daddy's and Aunt Peggy's, he replied casually. And how long has Peggy been living with you? Maria asked. Since we moved into a new house, I replied dispassionately, enjoying the dessert. Suddenly Maria exclaimed, Albert Kraft! It looks like someone has revealed our little secret, I said kissing Peg on the lips in the kitchen. You know, it was only a matter of time. We never directly told the children to keep quiet, and it was inevitable that Mom and Dad would find out as soon as I started showing, Peg said, gently stroking her tummy. I asked, holding out my hand. With pleasure, Peggy replied as we entered the dining room. The atmosphere was reminiscent of the shock and awe of the Gulf War. 
Maria was furious to find out that I was now in a relationship with her younger sister. Her mother was overjoyed to learn about the arrival of another grandson, and her father was grateful that he did not have to accept a new son-in-law into the family. As for Peg and me, we couldn't be happier. I may have married the wrong sister from the very beginning, but I am grateful that I was able to correct this mistake before it was too late. Maria had an abortion, which complicated her health. Five months after she had an abortion, she was found to have a malignant tumor. Now Maria is in a desperate state and blames herself for everything, claiming that this is her punishment for behaving like a dissolute woman, not a mother and a faithful wife. I found myself in a charming import store located near Piccadilly Circus in the bustling center of London. Aimlessly sorting through the unique products on the shelves, I was not looking for anything special. Suddenly, a familiar female voice said my name, which I hadn't heard for quite a while. Turning around, I met the gaze of a pair of warm brown eyes that were still capable of making my heart beat. It's incredible how quickly emotions can overwhelm me. At that moment, I felt a flutter in my chest. My emotions were in turmoil as I was overwhelmed by the unexpected presence of this woman. At first I felt a strong urge to hug her, but it quickly turned to cold bitterness. I stared at her for what seemed like an eternity, although it was probably only a few seconds. Hello Gretchen, what a surprise, I managed to say, and returned to watching, hoping to avoid a conversation. But I knew Gretchen well enough to know that she wouldn't let it go that easily. Do you have a few minutes to spare? What is it? She asked playfully. I'll let you buy me a coffee and we can catch up. I'm not sure, Gretchen, I replied firmly. I have time, but I'm not sure we have anything to discuss. I wasn't in the mood to be polite to the woman who ruined my life. I knew she wouldn't give up so easily, but she'd have to put in some effort. Sighing softly, she prayed. Please, Michael, I really want to talk to you. I'll even buy coffee. I stared at her for a while before finally giving up. Okay, but call me Mike. I don't call myself Michael anymore. She rolled her eyes slightly and said with a touch of arrogance, I suppose I have the privilege of addressing you as Michael if I so wish. Fine, Pookie. Whatever you say, I replied. She seemed stunned that I'd used the old affectionate nickname I used to call her when we were a couple. Earlier, in happier times, I would playfully sneak up behind her, hug her to me and shower her with caresses. I said in a playful tone, Come upstairs, hands, and show me some love. I need you, Pookie. I can't do without you. Ha, get away from me, naughty boy. You won't get any caresses from me until I tell you. Go cool off in a cold shower, you insolent scoundrel. Sometimes these short games turned into me chasing her around the house or dousing her with water from the kitchen sink. It was all a lot of fun, and we both enjoyed it. Those were the days. She was confused for a moment, and then she said softly with a note of sadness in her voice. You won, Mike, she said. I was stunned by her response. I felt that there was a deeper meaning in her gaze than could be conveyed in simple words. She quickly walked up to the counter and spoke to the owner in a language that was foreign to me. The petite Asian woman behind the counter looked in my direction and nodded solemnly, and then motioned for us to follow her into a cozy coffee bar located at the back of the store. When we settled down at one of the two small tables in front of the bar, she kindly handed us two steaming cups of coffee with a newfound smile on her face. She seemed to know exactly what we needed without even asking. Gretchen chose a place near the bar and the wall, and I instinctively reached for a chair by the door. Muscle memory never fails. We've done this procedure countless times in the 24 years of our marriage. I always sat facing the door, a habit I developed while serving in Vietnam. Despite the passage of time, our rituals remained unchanged. From the smile that appeared on Gretchen's face, I realized that she, too, had noticed our usual routine. We sat in silence for an eternity, and my thoughts inevitably returned to the memories of the last time I saw my ex-wife, 
a beautiful woman whom I once considered my life partner. We lived in a quaint town in Connecticut, and I naively believed that our marriage was a happy one. But over time my wife began to move away, and a gap formed between us that I could not ignore. Despite my attempts to bridge the gap and rekindle our bond, it seemed that our once happy union was slipping away. Our children have long since left our home, and we are left alone to experience this new chapter in our lives. As our children began to enter adulthood, our son Brett, the oldest at the age of 23, had recently graduated from college. He tied the knot with his sweetheart Amy in high school, and now the two of them lived in New York, returning to their cozy townhouse in New Jersey by train. Their love for each other was obvious, and watching their journey together was very touching. Our second child, Misty, was a bright 21-year-old fireball full of energy and passion. My daughter is the most important person to me. Our bond is special, and she's a bit of a free spirit. During my school years, I often held back my frustration and anger. But by her sophomore year of college, she finally realized that our rules were serving her well and pulled herself together. She is now doing well and is going to graduate from college with honors. It's amazing how things can change. When I was editing an article for work, my wife called me with the news. Do you mind having lunch together today? Hi Michael, this is Gretchen. I know it's at the last minute, but I thought it would be fun to shake things up a bit. With pleasure. Sure, baby, sounds like a plan. I'm glad you came to me. Do you have a place in mind or will I choose it myself? I asked. How about a meeting at a Paris cafe in 45 minutes? Will that suit you? Gretchen asked, restrained but cordial. It felt like progress, although there was still some distance between them. I was delighted and full of hope for positive changes in our relationship. I'll be there with the bells. Do I need to wear something else? I joked, trying to diffuse the situation and express my happiness. Yes, please, she replied, not amused at all. Okay, see you at 12.15 p.m. Thanks, baby. It's a fantastic idea. I love you, I said, getting up from the table and smiling broadly. Okay, I'll see you in a while, she replied simply. Hurrying to the car, I drove to the other side of the city to meet my beautiful wife for lunch. The joy I felt from her caring gesture was indescribable. When I entered, she was already sitting at the table with a glass of wine in her hand. I gently touched her shoulder and bent down to kiss her, but she turned her head slightly and offered me her cheek. I should have taken it as a sign. Grinning stupidly, I playfully greeted her. Hello, beautiful. Are you looking for a mate? She giggled and offered to order first so that we would have more time to chat later. During lunch, she talked about her translation projects at International Trade Incorporated, an import-export company where she worked as a language specialist. Listening to her, I couldn't help feeling anxious, especially when I noticed that she hardly touched her food. After the plates were cleared, she confidently paid the bill with her business credit card, assuring me that her boss had approved my invitation to lunch. When she paused and began to avoid eye contact, I felt that something was wrong. Just when I was about to ask, she met my gaze and spoke. I need to tell you something difficult, Michael. I've been in a relationship with another person for the last eight months. I have feelings for him, and I think we need to get a divorce. Those words hit me like a ton of bricks. I was speechless, unable to comprehend what I had just heard. It seemed like my world had shattered into a million pieces in an instant. Despite everything I've been through in my life, nothing has shaken me to the core like this. I felt completely depressed and lost, unable to think or speak. Everything I knew seemed to have been taken away from me. She further informed me that he was incredibly rich, in fact a billionaire, and that he would take care of all the expenses related to the divorce. Thanks to his wealth, she assured me, they would not require anything in the settlement of the divorce proceedings. I can keep all my possessions. I vaguely remember her mentioning that my small possessions would remain untouched. At the mention of the word property, she made a disgusting gesture with her fingers in quotation marks. Although I understood what she was saying, her words seemed to be ignored. It was like I was in a tunnel, 
watching my wife speak, but I didn't hear a single word she said. Every word sounded like bells ringing in my mind. She continued, expressing her desire for me to come to terms with the situation for the sake of both of us. Resistance will only prolong the pain and lead to the inevitable result. She's leaving for Europe with him tonight and has no intention of returning anytime soon, at least until the divorce issue is resolved. She used the word not allowed, a chic touch. She begged me to let this process develop without interruption. She acknowledged my concern for her happiness and assured me that this decision would bring her joy. As soon as I get settled in Paris, I will contact the children. I don't know how they will react, but you don't have to worry about it, she said, standing up and leaving me perplexed. The children, as it turned out, did not take the news very well. They were just as shocked and offended as I was. She never contacted them, and I had to break the news myself. I was even accused of hurting her and getting rid of her. The months after my wife left were stormy, filled with bitter arguments between me and my children. We thought about our actions and pointed fingers at each other, trying to figure out what caused the situation. I managed to gather some information about Gretchen's boyfriend unofficially in her office. I searched the internet for his photos or articles and found several where he was seen with Gretchen, which proved my innocence in her disappearance. Surprisingly, none of the photos mentioned her name, although many other people were listed in the caption. It turned out that they wanted to keep their privacy at home. A year later, I managed to get my life back on track and rediscover my passion for life. During this period, I became friends with a small group of disgruntled people who had previously worked with Gretchen. Through them, I found out that the top management of the company knew about Gretchen's affair and even helped hide it. Obviously, Gretchen's connections with some companies played an important role in making valuable business deals, and therefore management set itself the task of maintaining her satisfaction. It got to the point that some employees were sent memos with instructions to remain silent and not pay attention to the situation. The affair with Gretchen took place during working hours at the company. A trial was inevitable. And yes, I sued them. Now I live comfortably thanks to their financial compensation. I didn't seek revenge on Gretchen and Herbo. Although part of our divorce agreement includes keeping Herbo's identity a secret, I'm willing to make those responsible feel the consequences of their actions. It's been three years since our last lunch, and now I'm sitting at the community table across from my ex-wife. Despite her impeccable appearance, expensive clothes, perfectly styled hair, and flawless makeup, there was fatigue in her eyes. The beautiful brown eyes that I once loved now seemed dull and lifeless. It was as if she had lost a spark. Her inner light had gone out. Happiness and excitement used to dance in her eyes, but today they remained empty. It was clear that true happiness was still eluding her. You look great, Michael. I'm sorry, Mike. You seem to have lost weight and gained muscles. She began the conversation. Thank you, I replied simply. It was clear that she wanted to start a conversation. Yes, it's just amazing, I replied. In my new role, I do a lot of translation work and even learned a couple of new languages. She kept looking for an opportunity. You've always surprised me. You are incredibly talented and beautiful, I said. When I finally opened up to her, she looked down and tears welled up in her eyes. Thank you, she whispered. I get almost no recognition these days. I'm not even sure if anyone knows about my existence. I thought your husband would introduce you to the world, I replied. He never married me, she confessed. I'm just a talking toy that speaks several languages. When he wants to impress someone, he puts me out to entertain and talk to him in his native language. It is rare to meet a 40-year-old American woman who can speak not only English, lead people by the nose, and, I believe, is ready for a sexual life. You've become a sought-after commodity. She looked at me sadly. What? Why don't you just leave? Get on the next plane and get out of here, I replied angrily. It's not that simple. I live in comfortable conditions, but I'm constantly being watched. It will be very difficult for me to escape. I can only talk freely with you because we met by chance in this store and I haven't left yet. Marika, who owns this store, 
is my close friend, and she helps me when I need to lay low for a while. It may not sound very good, but it's up to you. Let's continue. Why have you never talked to the children? It was hard for me to convince them that I hadn't done anything terrible to you. They were heartbroken that they hadn't heard from you, I asked. I needed answers, but she seemed to sink even deeper into her sadness. I couldn't, she whispered. I left that afternoon on a private jet. I was completely isolated from my previous life, and constant surveillance kept me in check. Suddenly she bent down and met my gaze. Michael, I can't count how many nights I've spent alone in a foreign country, longing for you in our house in Connecticut. I miss you and what we had, she confessed. I felt the familiar urge to fix everything for Gretchen's happiness, but I was drawn back there. Wait, wait, I interrupted her. I raised my hands in surrender, firmly stating, I can't fix your life for you. Moreover, I refuse to do it. It is unacceptable to complain about the situation you find yourself in when you chose what brought you here. The people I care about are suffering cruelly from the consequences of your actions, having no right to do so. It's unfair that their lives have changed because of decisions you made without their knowledge or consent. I bumped into you for the first time in three years, and immediately all the attention focused on you. I'm already tired. Have you even asked about your children? What kind of mother would neglect that? For your information, you're a grandmother now. Brett and Amy have a beautiful daughter who will turn two in a few months. In case you're wondering, her name is Brianna Lynn. And as for revenge, your daughter, do you remember her? In six months, she's getting married to a great guy named Trevor. She still hopes that you will come to the wedding, but it is incredibly difficult if you do not have an address or a way to contact you. Maybe I'll send an invitation to this address. I felt like I was starting to choke, but stopped myself. All my pent-up anger and pain were rising to the surface. What did I do to deserve such a cruel attitude towards myself? I loved you with all my being and everything I had, and you left me without saying goodbye to anyone. Have you ever thought about the fact that you never apologized for ruining my life? Don't come to me with excuses, I said. You've ruined everything. You destroyed us. You ruined my life. Looking for sympathy? You won't find him here. You lost that privilege three years ago at a cafe in Connecticut. I was about to leave, just like she did three years ago, when a British accented voice broke the tension. Mike, I can't leave you for five minutes without you flirting with a woman. I have to give you a good beating. She tried to pretend to be angry, grinning playfully, and her eyes sparkled mischievously. I was so engrossed in my tirade that I didn't notice Pamela enter the room. I greeted her warmly, saying, Hi, baby. Then I introduced Pamela to Gretchen, my ex-wife. Gretchen, shocked by my harsh words, now had to confront her replacement. She was speechless, trying to keep her composure. Pamela just held out her hand in a friendly gesture and smiled. It's nice to finally meet you, Gretchen. Mike has talked a lot about you though not in the most flattering way, I'm afraid. But I have to thank you for leaving him and giving me the opportunity to pursue him. Maybe it's not easy for him, but I'm gradually getting him used to it, Pamela said, and patted me on the shoulder with a smile. Then, turning to me, she said, It's really time for us to get on the train to Ely. I don't want to interrupt your conversation, but time is running out. I calmed her down by patting her leg and said in a comforting tone, don't worry, my dear. I'm just finishing up. Turning to Gretchen, who was still resisting, I said, We have to run, but thanks for the coffee and the time we spent together. I will pass on your love to the children, even if it is a little white lie. At the end of the handshake, I wished her luck in her search for happiness, gently hinting that maybe she was looking in the wrong place. Reflecting on the 23 years of our life together, I noted mostly happy times and expressed gratitude. Goodbye, Gretchen. Gretchen remained seated, and her expression reflected the shock I had experienced three years ago. Pamela and I took to the busy streets of London to catch the train. She didn't ask about the meeting, but I could tell by her silence that she guessed who it was. It was a rare moment of liberation for me. 
I felt free, even content.